Lecture 12, Using Technology and Illustrations. So as we've progressed to this point in the course, we're left with a number of different topics that we need to discuss and that I'm gonna to group together here. Initially, they might seem very diffuse and unrelated, but I think we'll recognize that there's a close connection between these and something that we can come to understand better. And these are the topics we'll discuss. Being a good guest speaker, how to handle microphones, scripture reading, visual aids and technology, and illustrations. Now, all of that seems quite diffuse and disconnected, but there is a core that I think wraps around all of these and brings them together. And that's this, it's the, the core concept for this lecture today. Everything you say and do must contribute to your core message and never just to entertain. Everything you say and do must contribute to your core message and never to entertain. This is related to some of the principles we've talked about earlier. Remember, I argued that communication is a whole person activity, meaning everything about you, your gestures, even your, your physical, your body language and your physical expression and your facial expression for sure, eye contact, voice, everything you do has to contribute to this core message. I've also argued that your message will not come across as authentic or be effective unless there's actually a heart level engagement with a message. And so one of our arguments went that the person themselves must be prepared, as in your life must be prepared. You want to become a better speaker? Well, become a better Christian because you're gonna change your insides and it ought to be from your heart, from the core of you that you're expressing your message. I think those concepts are related to this. And this would be that everything you do, even down to some of the logistics of how you work with a microphone or the technology you use or the illustrations you choose, all of this comes together and is part of your core message. It must all contribute to that core. Now, let me explain this idea out a little bit more, and it connects to what I would say is a broader vision for how I think about communication in general. I think one of the most basic ways that a student communicator can improve is to learn the art of having a single core concept and making your entire sermon or lesson drive that concept. Okay, let me contrast this with what I think happens too often. Too often, and I would even maybe say the majority of the student sermons I hear, look more like this. And what's going on now is that we have kind of point one, point two, point three, and these are just ideas that are out there. They're rather disconnected. The student might have some kind of transition or something that he explains, okay, moving from point one to point two. But at the end of the day, truthfully, it's just like three separate boxes. They're just kind of out there, and there's not really a strong connection between them. They're not really linked up. They're just floating out there separately. And I would encourage you to process what you're doing to not just have random points out there. I made my point now, you know, God is love, go a little bit further. God is gracious, go a little bit further. God is all knowing. And you end up with just random disconnected points. Versus the vision I'm arguing for here, every one of your points, even if you're going to, yes, sure, have these divided out in some clear way, that you do essentially have a point one and a point two and a point three, so that we could talk about here, well, okay, there's your first point, here's your second point, here's your third point. Sure, you can have the division of your points, but all of them ultimately are leading to your conclusion. They're all driving to the central concept, and critically, even if you have the separate points, each one of the points must contribute to your core. Here's a different vision of how I think things sometimes go wrong. I think we also sometimes allow our communication to form up something like this. 
So that what we end up saying are, you know, just various ideas assorted about. And so idea one and idea two and just all of these ideas going out in all of the directions, we end up with kind of a fan effect. The ideas spread, they're diffuse. And what's going on or what ties them all together, in our minds, there might be a link. I mean, somewhere in our own thinking, we have some kind of central core that connects all of them together. The listeners probably don't have a clue what that core is. And we don't always know what the core is. In fact, I'm afraid sometimes that realistically and practically, the core that binds all of the ideas together is that I was interested in all of these things today. These were the things I wanted to say and they occurred to me, or they are the things that I came up with to prepare for this message, and so this is all I've got. And so I'm just gonna talk about all of these things. That, as a contrast to what I'm arguing as a very disciplined method, that you're moving towards a specific point, and everything contributes to that point. Let me make one other observation about this. I could use something like the box metaphor, and I could just stack up the boxes. So I, I don't know, we could do something like point one stands on the bottom, and then point two builds on top of it, and point three builds on top of it. And so we kind of have like a tower structure. We're building it up like an architectural progression or something. I mean, we could do it that way. I like, however, this metaphor, because not only do we have the separate points, if we want to call those, one, two, three. I mean, there are three separate ideas here. Those three ideas united around the single idea, the core concept I'm calling. But the other thing I'd like to observe is I, I intentionally drew this to say it ultimates or it culminates, it goes somewhere, it's traveling somewhere as an arrow. There's a destination. And I think that's part of the vision for communication. Communication is not just, well, I communicated point one, point two, and point three. They heard the information, didn't they? I mean, I got it all out there. But communication is actually moving people from where they are, point A, to where I need them to be, point B. It's a progression. And the idea if you've done it correctly, is that when the listener finishes, when they've gone through and they've paid attention, we hope, to what you had to say, they've gone through now and they've arrived somewhere where they weren't when they started. When they started, they held these beliefs, these attitudes, they thought that these things were true, or maybe they just didn't care. And when they got to the end now, their beliefs, their attitudes, their emotional responses, their actions, have changed. Now they're a different person. And if you can do that successfully then, then your communication has achieved its ends. All of that would go back to remembering our core concept for today. Everything you say and do must contribute to your core message never to entertain. Okay, well that follows then. Everything I do is part of the progression of ideas moving towards that end. And if in a disciplined, careful way, we move through each idea in turn, then when we get to the end, there's a powerful punch, everything coming together unified to make the single point instead of diffuse, lots of different ideas going lots of different directions. Now, let me return back to what we said would be the set of topics we're going to discuss today. And these then, if I was going to illustrate being diffuse, these might come across as rather diffuse. These might come across as being lots of unrelated ideas. I think there's a way, as I talk through these, for me to highlight that, no, they're actually connected, and I think legitimately so for us to talk about them. Starting out with the first, my first concept is just how to be a good guest speaker. You're invited to speak for a, a setting or an event. Um, and so as the invited speaker, how do you conduct yourself well? And a couple of things I would like to hi highly uh, or highlight in how you think through this. Number one, as you arrive, as you begin your speech or your sermon, you should politely thank your host for giving you the opportunity. I think that's necessary right at the beginning, just 
to recognize that you're a guest, to communicate your appreciation for the opportunity, and to warm people up a little bit to you. What you're recognizing in this situation is that people don't know you, they're not familiar, and therefore for the first probably, I don't know, at least three or four minutes, they're mostly just trying to decide what you're like. They're mostly deciding what they think about you. And at that point, they're kind of distracted. So I think you can get away with, at the beginning, just having some social niceties, just talking about and appreciating, expressing some kind of connection. If you watch people that do this well, they will often draw connections that they have to the setting. In other words, if they have existing relationships in the church, if they know someone there, if the way that they were invited was because their uncle attends the church, they're going to make that connection for the audience. The audience basically wants to know, how are you connected to us at all? And they will often talk about that just briefly as a kind of a casual way. Um, if they're, you can use humor really effectively here just to kind of help people understand who you are. However, I would warn you that people can get going in this direction and end up eating a lot of their time. So I would encourage you to be polite, take maybe two minutes, three minutes at the beginning, and just make those connections, expressing your gratefulness to be there as a guest, and give them enough time to kind of see who you are, and then just move on, start preaching, get involved in what you're supposed to do. Um, one or two other practical points, never try to address major, complex, or controversial issues at a place where you are the guest. The word for this, or what we might call this, a label for this, is ambushing. And the, the metaphor of ambushing would be you have a group of soldiers traveling through the forest, or a traveler travelers going through the forest, and suddenly out of the bushes jump their enemies. Right? And so it's an ambush because nobody knew that this battle was coming, nobody expected it, everything was just going along normally, and oh, suddenly we have a battle. Don't do that. They didn't invite you as a guest for you to attack them. And maybe there's an issue between you and them, maybe they have a different belief on something, you're not the one to attack that. If the issue is so bad that it must be addressed, then you ought to talk to them about that before you start speaking. I think that's just ethical. They didn't invite you to come in there and attack them. And they're not going to listen to you anyway if you do that. If the issue is so bad, then you probably shouldn't speak there at all. Or at least tell them what you're going to do. But it's probably not even honest to surprise them by attacking them from their own pulpit. And a third suggestion here is to never ask for money. Never talk about your needs or your financial struggles or how difficult things have been for you. Even if you are a missionary, even if you do have great financial needs, I think saying that comes across as exactly what it is. And it's asking for money from the pulpit, using the pulpit to fundraise. And that's not what pulpits are for. Pulpits don't exist for you to raise money. Now, I understand if a missionary is invited in, and so then the question might come, what is your financial need? I think in that kind of role as part of your missions presentation, it's possible to say, we're very grateful God has provided this amount of our funding and we're praying for the remaining 25% and move on. I think it's possible to say that kind of thing and just in a simple, clean way, state it, the reality of it, state it on the positive side. We're grateful for the provision God has given us. But as part of your sermon, to use an illustration perhaps that talks about how difficult you were, you were in this situation, you had no money, and so you're praying that God will provide, that kind of thing, people see right through that, and they recognize that you're saying that partly because you're, you're asking for money. This is not what a pulpit is intended to be used for. The next topic, microphones. How do you handle them? How do you do it well? So I think a, maybe a helpful starting point would be to know that microphones are not really that terribly old. They were invented in the 1870s and it's only the 1930s when they become very common that everyone expects to be able to use one. And before that time then, the only way that you could be a good preacher or that you could hope to become a preacher to speak to any 
large crowd was that you had to have a strong voice. I mean, the, the assumption would go, if you can't speak loudly and clearly, then you're not called to be a preacher, at least to any group of people that's very large. And I think the lesson of that goes, don't assume that you can only speak when you have a microphone. You have a voice. It's capable of projecting pretty well. And you just have to learn how to do it. Okay, people will sometimes say, I don't have a very strong voice, I don't have a loud voice. Um, if something happens, as in some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of emergency, or they need to call for somebody at a long distance away and they really need help, all of a sudden they find a way. I mean, they can yell across a long distance if needed. So it really comes down to more getting past, I don't know, some reservations and being willing and ready to do it. But we have to learn to adjust our volume and just project, meaning speak loudly and clearly across a loud, long distance. Um, fitting in with this, I think as a speaker, you have to learn to adjust your volume according to the need of the situation as well. So uh, different situations, acoustics, the size of the room, whether there is a microphone or whether the microphone is working well, you ought to, when you step up to speak, immediately adjust your situation, your speaking volume to the way that the room is set up. One of the things I've noticed that's just very odd to me is that let's say there's a, a large group of people, someone sitting in the front, they stand up and they might speak, let's say to share something. If the bulk of the audience is behind you, okay, so I'm standing at the front of a large room, most of the audience is behind me. It's just the sensible thing, turn, and address most of the audience, right? For whatever reason, we naturally might just address the speaker, but recognize where your audience is. Oh, they're over here. Okay, that's the direction you ought to turn and your, your body ought to reflect or the direction that you're speaking ought to reflect where the audience is there. Speak to them. You ought to speak loud enough that you can hear a little bit of echo coming back at you. If you're speaking and there's nothing coming back at you, you're probably not speaking loud enough. The people at the back probably can't hear you. And by definition, if they can't hear you, you aren't communicating, right? If they can't hear you loud enough to understand your words, nothing's happening. So it's your responsibility as the speaker to make sure that happens. One or two other things about microphones. People are sometimes afraid of the volume when they start speaking into the microphone. So you come up and I'll pretend that this is a microphone. You step up and the microphone is here and you, you go up too close, hello, and you get this, uh, okay, out of the microphone, this loud sound that comes back and people jump back. And what they'll do now is they'll put a huge distance between themselves and the microphone to try to control the volume. Um, give yourself a reasonable distance don't panic. Microphones are supposed to be loud, right? I mean, that's it. So if you are getting away from the microphone so far that it's not even picking you up, it's not fulfilling its purpose. Give yourself a reasonable distance and generally you aim for something like about this kind of distance. Maybe let's say a foot is, is getting pretty distant depending on the quality of the microphone, but you know, eight inches to a foot distance from the microphone and then just speak normally. Okay, you don't have to control your volume in order to control the entire system. Speak normally. Let the people that are handling some of that manage it. At least there should be somebody who's managing or who can adjust if it's too loud. But make sure that you speak close enough to the microphone that there is some volume. The speaker is supposed to let his or help his listeners hear. And it's your job to speak correctly. You're probably not doing it right unless you are hearing that kind of feeling of, whoa, this is really loud all around you. Um, I would say practice. If you're not accustomed or if you're, if you're just not comfortable using microphones at all, find a time and a place where the audience or the, the room is empty and someone will let you just stand there and talk 
and practice. You could read a section of the Bible or you could recite a verse from memory and just practice getting used to hearing it back and maybe have somebody there who can tell you, yeah, okay, that's about the right volume. Just establish a normal distance and then just speak normally, but loud enough that you can hear some of that coming back at you. That's okay. And finally, one other comment about microphones. If the microphones squeak, sometimes you speak and you hear, um, it's, it's not your fault. It's not that you did anything wrong. Don't panic. If it's happening over and over, you could say something um, just to, to acknowledge it. You know, if, if it's going on for several minutes and nobody's doing anything about it, you could say, I'm hearing a little bit of a ring back. And hopefully the sound people can fix it and just leave it to them. At that point, you need to just move on, okay? But if it squeaks, it's not that you made a mistake. You didn't do anything wrong. Just keep on going. Third topic, <clears throat> scripture reading. So scripture reading is a very basic kind of public speaking that everyone ought to do, and you're going to be called to do probably at some point. At some point in the life of a church, someone's going to say, could you stand up and read these verses for us? So you should be able to do this, whether you regularly speak, preach, teach, or not. And a couple of pointers for how to do this well. For one thing, if you can possibly get the section of scripture, if you know that you're going to be assigned to read this section, practice it beforehand. And that's a very basic thing. Just read all the way through it out loud by yourself in a, a, a quiet setting. Read all the way through from beginning to end and get familiar with out loud how it sounds and what you would say. <clears throat> Um, you may not be able to do that, though. Sometimes you're just called on to read a verse right there at that moment. And a couple of uh, encouragements here. The difference between good reading and bad reading, people who read it in a really flat way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The difference between that and someone who reads it well, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Okay, good reading versus bad reading is how much you are thinking about the meaning of the words. And the reason I say this is for some reason, when people start to read out loud, reading a text like this, they go on autopilot. They stop thinking about meaning. All they think about is how can I make sure I don't make an embarrassing mistake? And so I'm just going to try to get through this, but I'm not even thinking about what I'm saying. And I mean that. There are times where I think the person is not even conscious at all of what it is they're reading. Well, you can recognize from some of our past discussions that, of course, that's going to be terrible. Because communication is fundamentally about, right, the concepts becoming so important to me in my heart and on a personal level that I'm excited about communicating and I communicate with my whole person. If my mind is not engaged, they'll know it. It'll be obvious. Well, in the same way, if you're reading and you're not mentally engaged with what you're reading, it's going to be really boring and awful to listen to. So the key here. As you read, you look at the sentences and you personally think about and respond to the beauty of these words. Wow, look at this. As you're reading, you personally be engaged and it will show in the way that you read scripture. And one other practical suggestion, when you come to hard names, this is one of the big concerns that happens. So someone is assigned a section and then, oh no, there's a set of new names in here or maybe even a piece of a genealogy. And nobody wants to read those names because how do I know how to say them correctly? I have good news for you. Nobody knows how to say them correctly. I mean, there's not like a, a book out there somewhere that you open it up and it gives you the official way to say these names. Truthfully, the people who said these names, they're all dead. And we don't know anymore how these names were even said. So how do you pronounce it? And I would encourage you, just do your best. Say something, say it confidently, move forward, just state the name. Zarakovit. I mean, maybe you got it wrong. Just say it. Zarakovit. Say it loudly, strongly, confidently. 
and keep on going. Don't stop and stumble over every name that's going to make it far worse. Just move on and say something. Don't make it a bigger deal than it ought to be. It's really not a big deal. Just read it as best you can. And even if you get a letter or two wrong, it'll be okay. Life will move on. I want to move now to our last two topics, visual aids and technology and using illustrations. And in order to set these up correctly, let me start with kind of more of a philosophy discussion or a foundation for talking about these. My foundation goes back to our core concept, even for the entire course. And that concept is that we are called to, to communicate God's words, not our own. You remember this idea that everything we communicate and everything we do has, contrib has to contribute to the core message. Why? Because God has spoken and we're communicating God's words, not ours. Okay, now since that's true, since everything we say and do must contribute to that core message or to use the metaphors that we used before, I'm working very carefully to have all of my points together contributing to that final powerful push. I don't want a situation where my illustrations divide up or diffuse the points I'm making. I don't want my illustrations to distract so that their thoughts go off that way or their interest goes off that way or at that point because I told a, f a funny story for the rest of the time now the interest is all connected so we've talked about so we've talked now about these three topics being a good guest speaker microphone scripture reading I want to move into our final two topics, and those are visual aids and technology and illustrations. How do you do these effectively? What's the foundation for doing a good job? And I'll start out by setting a kind of a more philosophical foundation for this concept, which rests upon our, poor, our core concept for this lecture. Remember how we said, everything you say and do must contribute to your core message. And it never exists to entertain. Everything you say and do is intended to contribute to this core. One of the ways we expressed this idea was in terms of these diagrams. And we argued, or I argued here, that you want your message to contribute all as one, everything, each one of your points, moving forward towards that final conclusion, right? One, two, three, and you hit that big idea at the end. Well, what I'm afraid happens with too many of our illustrations, or even our visual aids, our PowerPoints, is that we end up spreading our ideas out. And so one idea or one story leads them off in this direction. And at that point, honestly, what are they thinking about? Well, because I've used that illustration, they're off over here now. And my next point leads them off here, and now they're over here, and I lead them off here and over here. And at some point in there, maybe I tell a joke that I thought was really funny, but honestly, they're thinking more about the joke. Because I made this joke, it's on their minds, I'm telling them about a story that distracts them off, I've got a fancy PowerPoint with all kinds of graphic stuff moving around, they're not thinking about my point. They're not thinking about my message, their minds are off somewhere else. Another way to do this same kind of analysis is if we recognize that in terms of the speaker and the speaker's relationship to his audience, your communication is part of or inclusive of the PowerPoint, the visual aid. So here I'll do it in terms of this diagram. We have the speaker, we have the audience, we have the message. You've seen this diagram before, we've worked with it. Okay, now when I have a visual aid and I bring that into the equation, here's the way it would look apart from the visual aid. And now I've just added here my fancy PowerPoint with all the fancy stuff going on. What I'm arguing here in our lecture is that actually the speaker and the PowerPoint are in some ways competing for the audience's attention. And what I mean is, I would like you to process the PowerPoint as kind of a speaker that's in competition with you, speaker number two. And at that point, truthfully, 
if you have a lot of fancy stuff going on up here, are they thinking about what you're saying? Or are they thinking about your fancy transitions? Is their mind on your message? Or is their mind on your PowerPoint? And what I'm arguing, or what I would suggest, is that actually the speaker number two up here is, if you don't handle him right, He's not going to be your friend. He's not going to help you communicate. He's a competitor. And given the choice between speaker number one, you, and speaker number two, they'll probably choose speaker number two. Because honestly, screens are going to be more interesting, or it's a lot more exciting to see the slides come up. They listen to you every week. But the PowerPoint, wow, that constantly changes how it looks. I've even had situations, just confessing for myself, where I was sitting in a sermon and what was up on the screen was, it wasn't a PowerPoint, it was just blank. It was just the logo for a church. That was it. It was just a nicely designed logo and the preacher's going along and I realized, I caught myself, I was looking at the screen and I was thinking about the logo. I was thinking about the nice pretty display on the screen. What happened in that moment, even though this wasn't moving, this was more interesting to me and my eyes and my thoughts went that way instead of to the speaker. The speaker number two, the PowerPoint, was a competitor and at that moment the PowerPoint won against the primary human speaker. And my argument then would go, if you're not directly using the PowerPoint at that time, get it off. Make it go away. Make it stop. It should not be a competition between you and the PowerPoint. Your job is to make sure that the PowerPoint communicates together with you, not against you. My argument then is that all we have to do to be better communicators is to have a fancy PowerPoint. And it doesn't matter if our ideas are good or not. We just need fancy slides, transitions, and graphics. Even bad ideas will be good as long as we have a good PowerPoint. Okay, now um, I'm gonna pause with what I just did here. I just on purpose broke all my rules and I just gave you a visually loud PowerPoint, a really terribly loud PowerPoint. And at the same time, I read a paragraph. What I'm curious about, if you think about uh, what just happened, did you hear what I said and did you process my words. Because here's what I was reading, or here's exactly the words I was saying while I, pray, while I played those PowerPoint slides. The words I put up, or the words I said, were all that we have to do to be better communicators is to have a PowerPoint. It doesn't matter if our ideas are good or bad, we just have to have good slides, transitions, and graphics. Even bad ideas will be good as long as we have a good PowerPoint. Which is the exact opposite of everything I've been arguing. It's the opposite of my entire point. But I think it, hopefully, maybe illustrated my point. Because while I was doing this, I was saying something absurd. I was also playing this horrendously messy PowerPoint with all of this fancy stuff going on, on purpose to distract you. And I would suggest, I would suspect, that you maybe did not even notice what I said. In other words, I think my point was actually represented in what I did here. On purpose, I wanted to illustrate to you that the screen is a competitor to what I say. And if I have a lot of fancy transitions and eye candy and exciting, interesting stuff happening on here that makes you go, whoa, that's so cool. You're not even hearing my words anymore. My ideas are not winning. The PowerPoint is winning. The PowerPoint is a more powerful communicator than me at that moment. And if there's a competition between the two of us, the PowerPoint will win. The PowerPoint will always win. So back to our core concept. Our core concept is if you're not using it, and if it's not a core part of what you're doing at that time, turn it off. Make it go away. Don't ever let the PowerPoint compete with you.
A couple of supporting or practical suggestions for how to do PowerPoints well. So I'm going to put up here some examples of bad PowerPoints. These are not active, these are just, just the screens. Um, and I'll talk about transitions in just a little bit. But some of the things that can go wrong with PowerPoints that make them really hard to work with and actually more of a distraction than a help. This is a mess for two different reasons. One, the text is just too much. And I would encourage you, PowerPoint is not meant for putting up massive paragraphs, lots and lots of text. In fact, generally, I would use your visual aids, PowerPoint, the screen as a place where you put diagrams, a word or two, maybe a sentence. But by the time you get up into paragraphs with lots of text, for people to actually process that, they have to read. They have to read an extended section. And during the time they're reading, they're not listening to you. Okay, so that's a mess. Don't ever have anywhere near this much text. I would say one of those bullet points is too much. You just never have this much text. The other reason is putting an image behind it makes the text basically impossible to read anyway. And so they would do far better just to have something blank, black, or a single color, but not any of all of this graphic behind text is a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, in this case, this illustrates again, I think the idea that you just have too much text. And if someone has to read that long, it's terrible. Don't put text like that up there. A, a, a phrase, a word, maybe at the most a sentence. In this case, we're just looking at something that's so complex, you're not going to be able to absorb it. Um, here, I think this is just, the point of this is just that it's incredibly boring. And if it's not text that is um, going to be memorable or necessary to get up there, don't, this is obvious. So why go through all of this information? In this case, just the bright colors are too much. And in this case, using script fonts, stick with your simple fonts. Uh, something like this is going to be a much better font, but no reason to get fancy with lots of script fonts. The most you would do is maybe one letter, but generally just avoid the script fonts altogether. Um, my summary of all of that would be to say, you don't use a PowerPoint or a visual aid unless there's a compelling reason. In other words, the argument doesn't go, well, okay, I have what I'm going to say, but you know what? If I could put a PowerPoint in there, then maybe they'll pay attention now. If your ideas are dead, if your ideas aren't interesting, if your ideas don't grab people already, then the PowerPoint won't save you. I mean, you can't take b dead and boring ideas and make them interesting by putting them up on a screen. Fix the problem by making sure that your ideas are interesting. Fix the problem by making sure you're communicating powerful truths. Now, if the PowerPoint or if the visual display will help you communicate an idea more clearly, there are times when you can say more with a graphic than you can with just saying it. Okay, fine. In those cases, put it up on the graphic. There are even times when there's a list of items and people will be able to remember them better if they can see them. Okay, fine. But if there's not a compelling reason to do it, just don't do it. And there ought to be times when you just say, at this point, I want nothing on the screen. Or entire sermons or entire lessons where you say, today, I don't think it's worth it to introduce the PowerPoint and to have a competitor, an additional speaker on the stage with me, competing with me. Not worth it. I'm just going to focus on speaking the words and communicating the words that way. A few more pr practical suggestions. These taken from Kristen Ascension, who had some very good suggestions about speaking in general, and then specifically some practical suggestions for using visual aids. So several of these practical suggestions include make it simple. We've seen that just a moment ago. Make it large enough. If the text can't be read from the back of the room, it's not large enough. Make it, make it in advance. Make sure you've planned and that these are well designed. Um, I've been encouraged or I, I've benefited from making sure that I plan the times when I have I'm going to use it, and those are written in my notes specifically. I use a little emoji, 
and I'll put that at that spot in my notes, which is a reminder that at that, at that point, I plan to change the slide or I plan to use a diagram just because in the process of teaching or preaching, I might forget that I was planning to incorporate that. Make sure you make a point with it. I, this is the idea that rather than just, I have a lot of concepts and I put everything I say up on my PowerPoint. Generally, your PowerPoint is gonna be something simple, a word, a phrase or two, I'm breaking my own rule here, but a word or two that just captures the point you're making, a single point that you're going to grab in that, in that slide or in that display. Um, this is the supporting notion. Visual aids are to enhance, to clarify, not just to entertain. And um, I'll return to this concept in, in a moment. Don't just have a PowerPoint slide because I needed to have one. Don't pass visuals through the audience. You don't have like a, a physical object and you're going to send that around. That never works. They're going to start fiddling with it. Things are going to happen. You're going to lose control out there. All kinds of other stuff will stop happen, start happening. You just don't want that. Never turn your back to your audience. The idea here goes while you're speaking and let's say here is my slide on the screen. It's tempting for some reason to turn and be looking at the slide rather than speaking there over here. Now I'm looking at my slide and I'm paying attention. Just don't do it. Okay, this is part of the benefit of having the device in front of you and you ought to have some kind of way that you can see what's up there. And sometimes people will put their computer in the back of the room and then someone else controls it or they control it with a remote. That's bad. I need to know what's going on here. I need to know what's up on the screen. I really don't want to have to turn around and look in order to find out. The audience is the focus. Keep your focus on them. And then this is just a second speaker, a second communicator that ought to support you as you communicate your ideas. Um, display visuals only while you're discussing them. And this is what I've already mentioned to you before. Very important if you're not actively using that display at that time. If that display is not part of the point you're making, get it off. Make it a black screen, but you should not have that just up there because I don't know why it's just up there. And finally, definitely practice with your visual aids ahead of time. If I was going to summarize all of this information and point us in the direction for where we're going for our next topic, actually, the core concept of it goes, you don't just use visual aids because, I don't know, I just wanted to have something up there. It's not just a default, as in, well, I, you know, I, I tried to get all my points on the PowerPoint and there was nothing to put up there, so I just grabbed my points and threw them on there. You always have a compelling reason before you choose to use the PowerPoint. Your default ought to be no PowerPoint. And only if you have to have it do you put it up. That transitions me to our last discussion, and this is illustrations. So the idea of an illustration goes, you're making your point as you com communicate, as you teach or you preach, but you realize that it's all in the abstract. It's all just description or ideas. It's fuzzy. And so if I can get some kind of story or example, then that illustration would help make the point. Okay, so to use illustrations from what we've discussed right during this time, I've tried to follow my own rules. I haven't always. During this lecture, trying to do what I'm talking about. And there were certain times during the lecture where I would give an illustration or I would tell you an example to show you what I meant. So I'm not just giving ideas, but I'm actually going to illustrate it with one particular instance of it. And the, the foundation for that would be that you can accomplish, I think, three different things through the comparisons that we'll make here. Option number one or possibility number one, making a complex idea clear. Sometimes you find yourself talking around and around and around and you explain in all kinds of different ways, but the idea is just complex. Sometimes you can bring it into clarity with just one comparison, one illustration. You can make second an application stick. This would be more in a preaching type of situation. 
But in order to really hammer this idea home, to really make it powerful and finish out the concept, then this giving an illustration or an example of a time when you either did well or you did not do well or where you saw somebody carry out what they were supposed to do, that might really make the application powerful. And finally, thirdly, creating an emotional response. Illustrations can be really powerful and make the point very well. In all three of those cases, however, there is some kind of connection point between the concept you're communicating and the story you're telling or the illustration you're giving. Over here, the point you're making. Over here, the illustration that will be part of developing that point. And where I think people break this down, where it doesn't work, where things go wrong, it's all in this connection point between the two. Someone finds an illustration and they include it in their sermon, but that connection point is not clear. And so the entire thing fails because you didn't make a strong, powerful link between those two. If your audience doesn't know how this illustration connects to this concept, then your illustration was pointless. But you've got to make that connection clear. And the biggest thing I notice happening when I'm just hearing illustrations out there is that someone tells a story, the story is included in there, and then they go on to preach a, a few more points. The link between those is non-existent. I'm looking at it and I'm wondering, did the person tell the story just because they wanted to tell the story? I mean, was this just a story that was on their minds and they, they thought it was a fun one, they thought people would enjoy it. And so I toss it in there because, well, I need something at this point. One of the concepts I did not include as a possible purpose for illustrations, remember I gave you three, making a complex idea clear, making an application stick, creating an emotional response. I did not include getting attention. And I think this is one of the primary ways that people think of using illustrations. They think of an illustration as an attention getter. And it might be a completely invalid way to use an illustration. One of my teachers said, you know, you can get, an, uh, you can get people's attention by just doing something inappropriate, right? I mean, you could, I don't know, sneeze or um, say something you shouldn't say in the pulpit. And that would get everyone's attention. It's just not the attention I want. The kind of attention I want is not just, oh, well, now you're thinking about whatever crazy thing I did. The attention I want or need is the attention not on me or on my story, but on the message, on the concepts of the text. And in order to do that, then, you have to remember the concept of the link between them. You have to have a strong link so that this illustration carries you straight in, powerfully, directly, and it carries that emotional impact or that clarification. It makes the point stronger for your message, not just to grab attention. Okay, let me then do what I think would be appropriate here and illustrate with several examples, some of the concepts I'm talking about. So I'll start here first with an illustration that I heard someone do recently that I thought was really, really powerful. Uh, the point of the message or the discussion was how you use relationships or build on relationships, loving people, caring about people, investing in them, and then talking to them about the most important realities, the gospel. And even how God uses some of our life circumstances to prepare for some of that. Okay, now the pastor had recently lost his wife of many decades, I think 30 to 40 years. So she had died suddenly of cancer. And now therefore there's all of the grieving process with that. And he just mentioned, he said uh, recently he was in a store somewhere and he met a young man. And the young man had also just buried his wife. And the young man said, I've got a lot of questions. For instance, I can't figure out how long I should continue wearing my wedding ring because now she's gone. And the pastor said, you know what? This morning I was 
awake at three o'clock in the morning thinking about the very same question because I just buried my wife. But let me tell you about some of the things God is teaching me. And that turned into a relationship. Okay, now he included that as part of his illustration, as an illustration, as part of his, his point, which was go out there and seek for even possibly sacrificial, costly relationships, but good relationships with people around you, help them, love them, pour into them for the sake of sharing the gospel. Well, that illustration was so powerful and so memorable, it made the sermon. I mean, that illustration made everything else memorable. And it was a very powerful use of responsible good use of an illustration. The link was very strong going to where he was going. I'll give a contrary example. I had an instance where I had a joke that I thought was really funny, and I incorporated it in as part of my message, and I thought the, the fit was okay. Um, it wasn't, and it was pretty obvious that I just wanted to include the joke as part of the sermon. I mean, it, it, I, it was obvious that it was just I wanted it in there because I thought it was funny. And in this case, what did it do? All it did was distract. In fact, the people didn't even laugh. They didn't even think it was very funny. But it distracted from my message, pulled away from what I was trying to say, and it didn't work. The whole thing failed. An example that comes to my mind that did work, I was preaching on Hebrews 12, and this is the great cloud of witnesses, the company of witnesses. You're running the race, lay aside every weight, run with patience with diligence even through pain towards the goal and the power or the encouragement of knowing that lots of people have come before you and done this and I was thinking through this back to a time when my wife and I ran a marathon we exhausted ourselves she finished already I was behind I was in pain feeling terrible and I had another mile and a half to go and just felt like I couldn't do it and as I'm going along, there are people out there saying, you can do it, come on, you can do it. And they're holding coffee cups in their hands and in their pajamas. And it's obvious that they just got up on Saturday and walked out there and they're just kind of relaxing. I mean, they didn't run the race. So for them to say, you can do it, doesn't really encourage me or motivate me to keep on going. It's like, okay, well, that's nice. But I mean, you're in your pajamas after all. But what really made all the difference for me was when I saw runners that were walking back to their cars and they were sweaty and looked awful and all torn up and looked like they felt the way I felt, which was terrible. And if those people said, you can do it, I thought, okay, they ran the race, they ran this mileage, they've experienced it. And so in that kind of illustration, for that then to support the idea that believers can keep on going, because look, you also have a hard race to run and it hurts. And there are times when you want to stop, but it's not just the believers or other people out there saying you can do it and they've never run the race. No, it's people that went before you and have suffered and have also experienced the pain. See, but climactically, it's not just the other believers, but it's ultimately Jesus, who himself, fully God, fully man, does not just sit in heaven and tells us from that distance, a safe distance, you can do it, keep on going. But he actually entered into our sorrow and our suffering, and he also experienced the race and ran it. Now, I think the reason that illustration worked was because it the link between that and the passage is very strong. The link is strong enough that you're not just kind of making up a connection, but the parallels run really deep and really solid throughout. A couple of other practical encouragements for illustrations. Um, make sure as you're giving the illustration, you don't want to include any in inappropriate elements. If you have a question about whether it's appropriate, appropriate or not, just skip it. You also don't want your illustrations to overwhelm the core content. The core of your message should be biblical content. The illustrations are not the message. They're only supporting the message. So at the core, make sure the illustrations are just servants of your message, not controlling the message. 
And finally, I would say if you're going to include personal illustra illustrations, that's good. Just make sure you're not always the hero of the story. When you see a pattern and every time someone gives an illustration, they're always positive in the illustration. I think you've missed something. Actually, you've lost an opportunity, which is to show your listeners that you also are needing to grow, that you're also in the process of growing. And so you've got to be willing to include illustrations where not only you did the great thing and you did it well, but also where you failed, because we all have times when it goes well and times when it does not. Where will you find good illustrations? I don't use illustration books. Um, you're going to have to find illustrations by doing a lot of reading and being curious and learning about a lot of things and paying attention. It's work. But if you'll pay attention, if you pay attention ahead of time long enough that maybe a week before you're preparing the sermon and then as you live life, this thought is in your mind and you're processing, thinking about these concepts, the illustrations will come. You ought to be a reading person, paying attention, writing down illustrations that really grab you in the things that you're reading and then using those as you go forward for future, for future opportunities to communicate. A conclusion. And let's tie these ideas together and link it to the overall concept of this course. Our core concept has been that everything you say and do must contribute to your core message never to entertain. That goes down to illustrations or, il or visual media, PowerPoints. Any of these components that are contributing to your core message, you don't want those ideas to be pushing outwards, diffusing your message. Remember our diagram, you want every piece of the message to contribute to the single one arrow driving forward to the point you're going to make. Everything united to make that point. If you cannot demonstrate the clear link between your illustration and where your ideas are driving forward, then you ought to just not include the illustration. And the reason we will say that, this concept of your core message, the one arrow pointing forward to the one idea you wanna communicate, rather than just entertaining, is because of our core concept for this course. God has spoken, he commands us to speak for him, therefore we must learn to do it well. The goal of preaching is not just to capture people's attention, and certainly not to entertain. The goal of preaching is to communicate God's words and to communicate them well. Now, since he has given us his words, then that means that the core of our message can't be the illustrations. It can't be just engaging people and making them interested or capturing their attention. Because that's not the point. The point of preaching is to, com to communicate what he said. And that means by definition, the illustrations, the PowerPoints, all of the supporting stuff, all of those things are just subservient to the core. The core is what God has said. He defines that. You know, if the illustrations or the diagrams or the PowerPoint can help me communicate that a little better, great. But may it never distract from the core. The core is something that he has already said, and it is my job to simply communicate clearly, memorably, what he has said. As we then work through all of these elements of communication, from being a guest speaker to microphones, to how to communicate with illustrations and how to use visual media, and then to put all of that together into a unified total picture communicating God's message well, may his truths and his ideas always stay at the center he is the grand communicator. We are only his messengers. And even our illustrations and our use of visual media must contribute to that, to what he has spoken, and not to what we would want to say.